I think we can start. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, hello everyone. Thanks for joining me this morning. I hope you're having a great time so far. And today I'm going to talk about agro rollout at scale, or how we brought automated rollbacks to more than 2,100 microservices at Monzo. So, a little thing about me and why I'm doing this talk in the first place. So, I'm Joseph Palamidesi. Here, a picture of me with like much more air. Um, I'm a backend engineer uh, working in the platform team at Monzo. Uh, I led this migration project where we essentially replace our default deployment strategy to basically use agro rollout and automated rollback accounting uh, by default. Um, and I was a tech lead of the engineering effectiveness team, as we had like, a couple of discussions this morning during the keynote. So it's basically a team doing everything DevEx, um, all the tooling that engineers use, in, uh, use to interface with the platform, and also a deployment pipeline, CI, CD, and observability stack. Uh, and I, you can probably hear already, I have a strong accent, and unfortunately, I cannot do anything about it. So please bear with, bear with me. Um, so first of all, what I'm going to talk about to, uh, this morning. Um, this is a study case of how we make it, migrated all of our services to agro rollout. As I said, they could become like the default deployment strategy at Monzo. Uh, how we did it safely because we're a regulated bank in the UK, um, and the name of the bank is, is Monzo. And that we're actually quite happy with what we, uh, what we got and, and what we achieved with agro rollout. And there will be a lot of emojis because it's part of Monzo branding. So. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit uh, since setting, uh, a little bit of context. So what is Monzo? It's a regulated bank in the UK. It's seven years old. It has more than five million uh, customers. It's one best British bank um, this year, I believe. Um, it is a mobile-only uh, banking app. Uh, as you can see, um, like what the basic app looks like. And if you've been in the UK, you've probably seen those very flashy hot coral cards that we're famous for, and that basically um, what they look like. From the tech point of view, which is uh, the, yeah, the tech stack point of view, the more interesting bit, is uh, Monzo really brought in the micro, into the microservices uh, philosophy. We have more than 2,100 uh, microservices or application, depending on how you, you call them. Uh, we have over 200 engineers, um, a good, uh, most of them back-end engineer. And that's where like, the int interesting number come in. We did last year 20, 27,000 pro deployment, and those are actual pro deployments. This is not config change. This is actual code that we push to, um, um, to, uh, to production. Um, everything is Golang, and the other interesting bit is everything is running in, in one mega Kubernetes cluster of like 300 nodes, uh, 20,000 pods, um, massive scale. It's, it's a really chunky uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and our, our entire platform is quite centralized and quite uh, homogeneous. Every Golang services looks the same and basically use the same libraries. Um, so as I mentioned, basically deploying at Monzo is our, is our bread and butter. We made that process like incredibly efficient, if, uh, like as, fish, as efficientless as possible for engineers to be able to deploy. Um, and basically our, our deployment uh, pipeline is unrolled uh, and you can deploy um, in less than two minutes, and that includes building the images. Uh, so it's very efficient. But we kind of like realize that will it's something we do like so often on a daily basis. Our deployment strategy was kind of simple. It still rely on community deployment, uh, community native deployment, uh, and use like a rolling update strategy, which basically means that engineer when you deploy stuff, and uh, because we do it so much, you kind of like needed to we had like alerting, genetic alerting, and also like. Um, uh, business level ad ad alert, but in general, kind of like add to babysit deployments, look at Grafana dashboard, which is, as you know, not super interesting. Um, and also, with our current setup, every time you do like a new release, you basically uh, release it directly to 100% of the customers. Um, as I mentioned, we are in a banking is a regulated industry. Downtime is very costly uh, financially in, in terms of reputation. I mean, for all of us in this room, like you don't definitely do, do not want downtime. Uh, but for us, it also be like the risk, uh, some like regulatory risk. Uh, if we down too often, or if like some very important payments uh, system are down for uh, long enough time, that might actually trigger some regulatory action. And those are quite unsavory. We kind of want to avoid, avoid that. So in order to do this, we kind of like try to try to stick to like um, 
best practices, and we have like, this Swiss approach to like, change management. So uh, we try to catch um, bad, changes, uh, bad changes and error at multiple layer, um, could review um, through like, our CI pipeline, uh, having a staging environment that is actually quite close to the production environment, generating and alerting, alerting. But we kind of realized um, that we did not have anything after you deploy. You basically deploy, and then it's, it's on you, uh, except for like, obviously like, some alerting. So we kind of wanted to make our deployment uh, safer. We wanted to reduce the cognitive overhead of like deploying, um, and also to allow for like more automation, such as like continuous deployment. Um, in short, like make deploying safer and quicker. Um, so we onboarded in this uh, progressive rollout initiative, and the big idea at the beginning were to move gradually, uh, move traffic gradually to a new version of the code, uh, of, of the code and also uh, automatically rolling back a bad, a bad change if that happened. Um, I need to do like a bit of introduction about Agro rollout. So this is like stolen from the from the project documentation. So Agro rollout is a Kubernetes controller and set of CRD which provide advanced uh, deployment capabilities such as Brewgreen and Canary, uh, Canary deployment. And um, what Agorolat more or less is, it's, uh, it can be used as a replacement of Kubernetes native deployment objects that basically essentially provide uh, more feature and you know, so those uh, advanced um, deployment capabilities such as uh, doing uh, staged, um, staged rollout through canary and things like that. But in essence, it can be used uh, either as a, a replacement for Kubernetes um, native deployment or uh, alongside them by essentially referencing an existing deployment, uh, deployment object. Um, so this slide is a bit, like there's a lot of things going on. Um, what I really wanted to like convey here is you have the rollout controller that basically manages the different rollout objects, but the central thing of um, our rollout as a rollout object, like, like I say, um, can be used as a replacement for like Kubernetes native deployment. That's why you, you can define like your um, pod template spec um, annotations, but also where you define what the deployment strategy should be like. Like for example, like canarying, um, shift traffic 10% for like the first five minutes, and then like 100% uh, um, uh, after that. And that's where you define all those things. That's also where you can define like uh, some analysis. So um, an analysis is essentially like a condition. Uh, using some metric providers, uh, some metric provider in our case, Prometheus, where you cannot define rules such as a rollback if um, you know that metric is above a certain threshold for like a couple of um, this amount of time, and so on and so on. Um, so yeah, in essence, that's basically what a go rollout look like. If you've been to the workshop yes, uh, yesterday, you probably played with it, and you potentially played with it a little bit, and that basically all there is to it, which is great. So and simple tool. Um, and why did we decide to choose our goal out in the first place? Is uh, because it was easy to understand and experiment with, uh, very well maintained and um, uh, well documented, and it kind of adds this kind of like plug and play quality to it, as you can just like install it alongside your like existing cluster. Uh, our cluster is like I said, very big, very complex. We pushed a lot of like business logic at the Kubernetes level, especially everything related to security. Um, we have like a custom like a network isolation um, capability built into uh, the Kubernetes layer at, uh, at Monzo. But even through all of that, you can just easily add uh, agro rollout. Uh, and you don't need much requirements for it to be working fine. It works better if you have like a service mesh that allow you to do like finer grain uh, traffic sh shaping. Uh, yeah, oh, perfect. Uh, finer grain traffic shaping, but even if you don't have a service mesh, it still works. Uh, um, like traffic shaping still works, it's just like a bit more like coarse. And it's highly customizable. Um, you can basically define like a custom rule for each of your like rollouts for each of the services, which is what we were looking for in the first place. Um, so now I need, need to talk a little bit about like our journey, how we, uh, how we did get to automated rollback at Monzo. Um, the first thing is a bit of a bait and switch. So I talk about canarying a bit. So canarying is uh, the when a canary deployment is when you shift traffic like progressively uh, to a new version of, the, of an app, um, and that's what we're looking for in the first place. But then we ask ourselves the question: Is that really what we want? Is that really what we needed? Because we're going from like a really simple process uh, of you know engineering and not having to like think about think, uh, that could be rolled back. Uh, you only have like one a couple of assumptions. You only have like one 
own version of the code, like running the cluster and so on and so on, to so something much more complex. Um, and there was a clear need to like, you know, educate engineer and the rest of the, of, of the org, and those are like a consequence of potential tooling. Um, and we're like, mm, is that really what we want? Is that really what we need right now? Um, by the way, um, this illustration is made with DALI, which is a game changer when you actually need to put illustration in your like, um, presentation. Uh, and as you can see, with this kind of wonky giant uh, canary and giant cage. Um, so, um, you know, reviewing canary deployment, we're like, actually what we care is reducing the impact of a bad change. Um, and what we were really actually uh, looking for is automated rollbacks. Uh, so that's what we decided to implement first. We kind of using a blue-green-like strategy at the moment. It still use uh, Argo Canary strategy, except you still go straight to 100% of the um, uh, shift um, the new version to 100% of the traffic. But you have this analysis um, period where you basically run those check to know if you need to roll back or not. And we did that to basically allow for uh, us to move to real canary in the future because we got most of the infrastructure and most of the work um, um, in place to be able to do that. Uh, basically going instead, going from like a rolling updates uh, strategy to just having automated rollback and uh, later on move to um, canary. And this is what the deployment workflow look uh, in this new world. Essentially, an, uh, essentially an engineer start the deployment that update the rollout object, new version, the new version of the app uh, become live. Then for like a short period of time, there is this analysis step uh, where like the different rules, like we call them rollback rules, are um, evaluated. And if they're su successful, the engineer is notified of success. We do that in Slack because we also like, um, um, we use basically a lot of Slack Slack ops. Uh, we have a lot of processes in Slack. Um, and if it's not, if there is uh, one of the rules um, actually evaluated to false, we uh, automatically roll back to a previous version where we notify the engineer and the team. Um, this workflow allows us to choose a strategy, uh, the deployment strategy per service and per deployment. So for each individual deployment that you, that you make, that allow you to potentially change what type of deployment do you want? Do you want automated rollback? Do you want canary? Do you want something more fancy in the future? And that's what this um, uh, flow allows us to do. Um, then again, this is probably not super interesting right now. It's more like if you're reviewing this talk later on and want to like look more about the details. Um, this is what it looked like from like an architecture point of view. So as I mentioned, everything in our deployment pipeline is enrolled. So we have a service that basically generates a manifest. And um, uh, so you say engineer use a CLI tooling called Shipper to, uh, to get a deployment that, trigger, that basically make one of the service create a new manifest for it, put that in a Git repo, and then this is uh, applied to another like services, another service that applies that to Kubernetes and uh, updates the rollout object, and then creates a new um, replica set and so on. Um, so basically, this is just to prove that we actually use GitOps. Um, and yeah, there will be a complimentary blog post about this talk with like all the nice gritty technical details um, about all the aspects of the work that we did um, for all of you yeah, if you actually love YAML. Um, so that's what the um, tooling is uh, look like. So at Monzo, we have like, this philosophy of backend engineers should not know about the platform. They should be able to interact with it, but they should not actually need to know things about, you know, Kubernetes like networking and um, or even like auto scaling. Um, so we have this one tool called Shipper to deploy, and um, the output is not super interesting here again here, but. What we just wanted to show you is you basically just deploy by calling shipper, giving it a, a, um, a commit hash, uh, name of a service, and it deploy it for you. And um, we basically completely abstracted away uh, Argo rollout. Argo rollout itself provides like, great tooling and great dashboard, but we decided not to like, expose that to our engineer and basically abstract all of that away, uh, which basically required us to, uh, required us to uh, integrate uh, with Argo rollout uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, same thing here, that's basically what our um, Slack notification look like when you start a deployment. Uh, it basically tells you, oh, you started a deployment with this strategy. Um, here's the dashboard to end the logs if you want to so see what's going on. Um, and, um, you know, and the notification kind of success of a successful deployment or like a failed deployment. Um, so I talk about rules and rollback rules. Um, so we actually started with only one rule and we try to 
keep our rule uh, as simple and generic as, po as possible. At the moment, all the services in, in our backend uh, use the same rollback rules, uh, so they have to be like quite generic. Um, and we started basically with um, if the total um, um, error rate of a, of a service is above a certain threshold, then you need to, uh, to roll back. Um, and about the rules themselves, we decided to basically tweak them and add them based on our incident handling process. Uh, so basically every time we have an incident or something that looks like an incident, we ask ourselves the, uh, the question, should that be caught at deployment time or could that have been caught at deployment time? And if yes, could have we made a rule to actually catch that issue? So the issue with like rules when it comes to like kerneling and automated rollback is a false positive is annoying for your engineers because the change are rolled back, the deployment is rolled back. Customers should not see much problem, hopefully, um, but it's really annoying and it's not great, uh, great UX. And you don't definitely want to avoid like a false negative where um, you're not rolling back where you actually should. Um, so yeah. Uh, so the takeaway here is basically if you're planning to move your entire organization to um, something more complex like our rollout, do it in step. Start as simple as possible. You don't need to go from like um, you know a simple process to something like state of the art with like very complex canary strategy. Uh, just start with what actually matters for your org, uh, and in our case, that was automated rollbacks. Um, Argo is relatively easy to integrate, um, uh, as you can see with all our custom, um, custom tooling, um, because it provides a lot of things out of the box, like through its notification engine, uh, the um, Argo rollout, um, uh, the, the Argo controller like metrics, like the rollout metrics, and uh, its CLI and dashboard are quite useful when you're like in development phase, uh, in the development phase. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you actually migrate to Argo rollout. And um, as I mentioned before, Argo rollout allows you to do it in, in an incremental, incremental fashion, where the rollout object essentially reference a dip, an existing deployment. So the rollout object essentially defines the strategy and a couple of other, um, other parameters, but the pod template spec and everything related to the actual uh, deployment uh, is still on the deployment object, and the rollout just reference it. Um, and this allows to basically migrate to our Argo rollout in a safe manner that avoid downtime, because you essentially just bring a new rollout object that reference the deployment object. At that point, you have two replica sets, one managed by the uh, deployment resource, one de um, managed by the rollout resource. And then you can safely decide to um, set the number of, of replica of the deployment to zero. So you just have like a replica set um, pod managed by the rollout object. And doing this, it's all for like a no downtime uh, migration, uh, which is great. And also um, doing it this way allow you to easily revert, uh, uh, reverse the process if you don't want uh, rollout again or you're just in an experimental phase. Um, so that is great. That is uh, super easy to do. Um, kubectl command probably like two, three minutes, uh, relatively safe to do, uh, except as I mentioned earlier, we have like 2,100 um, applications, so we need to do that a lot more, which kind of make us actually, there was a clear need to actually automate that process. And through um, this aut automation, we also decided to like unsoft, to enforce even more safety, because as I mentioned earlier, we are a regulated bank. We cannot really allow downtime and um, and also part of our like, company motto, make money work for everyone. And there is nothing more like uh, scary for our customers and having the card not working at the supermarket because, you know, product is down. Um, so we wanted to make, uh, to make sure like we're extra safe and that the whole process is repeatable, observable, and um, independent. Um, so that's what basically what the migration looked like for us is we first notify the service owner on Slack. Um, we create a new rollout object for that service that we're migrating. We freeze the deployment because we want to limit the amount of um, change we'll be doing this process, which is not very long. It's like on average two, three minutes per service. Um, and then we scale up the, the rollout, the number of replicas of the rollout. If your service uses an HPA, um, Will you do the migration? We wanted to make sure that we um, scale up the rollout to the max band of the HPA, just to be extra sure that if there is like a surge of load, will we do the migration? There's not going to be an, uh, any problem. And then we check if all the pods that we're supposed to see are actually uh, alive and well in our cluster. 
And only then we decide to scale down uh, the deployment to zero replica because we know that we have enough um, enough rollout um, replica managed by the by the, um, by the rollout object, um, and we, we then check that we don't have any deployment pods um, uh, pods managed by the deployment object left. Uh, and then if the service uses an HPA, we switch the target uh, of the HPA from the deployment to the rollout, and for the deployment, notify people of um, owner of success. Um, so that is great. So that's basically what it, uh, the process looked like. Um, and we decided to like execute on it by going for like a migrator, pat uh, migrator, uh, migrator pattern where essentially all the steps I just described are independent um, because that migrator pattern, uh, that migrator service uh, that we're using uh, will retry all the steps. Um, and that migrator button also like allow for like fine grained scheduling. We had so much services to migrate. We only wanted to do them like during business hours. Uh, we want to spread the migration across like the entire day because we want to avoid having too, many, too much pot churn in a short amount of time, for example, and just you know to basically control the amount of uh, of risk. Um, and we yeah, did all that through like a migration service where the user decided which service to migrate, and then uh, we had a cron every day that. Um, um, uh, trigger the migration for the services and spread them out through the, through the day. Um, we did it by uh, using your service uh, tiering. So we went from like, the lowest tier services to the highest tier services, so the less important service to the most important service. Uh, and by the time we actually got to migrate our tier zero services, including you know, the ledger service, which is you know, not a big deal, like just managing like four million quid. Um, um, so you want, that won't not be down because if it's down, all the payments um, or the payment system are essentially down. Um, by the time we got to those tier zero services, we already migra migrated with that process more than 1,700 services. So we were quite confident about it being quite safe. Um, so take away, if, make it safe, automate it. Like if you automate it, um, you can enforce like some additional like safety, um, safety rules. Um, obviously if you have like 10 or 20 applications, you can still do it by hand, it's probably much quicker. But as, as if your like, backend is like, big enough, that might be worth actually um, adding some automation. Um, the migration is actually what took the most time. Uh, the act of migrating is actually what took the most time because we had to do it slowly and carefully. Um, so, and, and, and we had to invest in tooling and monitoring to make sure that we could do this proce process safely. So in terms of like deployment, probably like half the time was just actually running the migration after we develop, uh, developed everything. Um, so what did we learn like moving to our rollout and running it at this scale? Um, first of all, some numbers because everyone likes numbers. So we have um, in our production cluster right now, 2,143 rollouts. Um, so 2,143 services running in production. Probably a couple more since I like, do the slide, did the slide like a week ago. Uh, we have seven rollback rules uh, that cover like, some things that are very specific to us, but um, are generated enough to catch a large, uh, class of, large classes of problem. And we've been running a rollout in production for essentially um, every services for like four months now. Uh, which means we did 7,000 production deployments with Agro rollout and 22,000 production deployments in staging. Um, because I told you we did 27,000 production deployment per year, but the truth is we did like more than 100, 100K uh, deployment to staging last year. Um, so yeah, we have like, we built like the confidence that Argo rollout is actually cap capable of operating at this scale. Um, and we are like 63 rollbacks um, since we basically um, start using Argo rollout. Um, yeah, so a little bit like less than 1%. Um, a couple of them are like false, uh, for, um, uh, false positive. Um, that's why there's a need, clear need to like tweak your, your rules. Um, so what about operating role at scale, which is like the whole point of this presentation, right? Um, actually, there was very little thing for us to do. It just kind of scaled uh, really well with our kind of like unconventional architecture. Like it's very unlikely that we have like one Kubernetes cluster that big and that many rollouts uh, running. We, um, but the, the Argo rollout controller did not have any issue with our scale of like operation at Monzo, which was quite surprising. We even had a small incident in staging where we did like 5,000 deployments over the course of like three hours and it worked, which is 
great. All the stuff broke, like Prometheus, but um, because of the pod term. But other than that, it actually worked quite well at like this very large scale. Um, there's a clear need to like share the knowledge about our goal out because it becomes a new critical component that uh, your ops and platform team need to understand quite well, um, and as well as the rest of the organization that need to understand that the process is a bit different now. Um, there was still one little performance issue about a leftover like analysis for an object, but we are on the case and we hope to be able to push a PR like soonish to actually fix that issue. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's important to, uh, to uh, invest into alerting and uh, observability uh, for uh, when operating Agrovol in general, and especially at this scale. And that um, the project make it easy because it already provides like most of the metrics you can think of that you would want to uh, to, uh, to monitor. Um, would we do it again? And should you? The answer to that first part of the question is yes, and the answer, uh, the other, and for the other question, yes as well. So for us, it was a clear positive outcome. Uh, we reduced connective, uh, the connective load of like deploying. We catch loads of issues across like tons of deployments. Uh, we're quite happy with what we got in return, and and also with how easy it was to actually set it set it up. In, given the amount of customization and, you know, like business specific stuff that is running in our cluster. Um, and it's a nice addition to our like um, Swiss cheese approach, like the in depth strategy to uh, control for uh, bad changes. And the most important thing is like engineers actually love it. Um, so this is one feedback that we got from a uh, backend engineer um, that basically got paid for an issue due to the deployment and it was automatically rolled back in, I think, less than a minute. Uh, and that would have been like a rather nasty, um, nasty uh, problem with basically the MasterCard 3DS processor on our, on our end that would have um, um, rejected like every, uh, every request, which would basically mean that a customer would not be able to pay with a MasterCard online for the duration of that incident. But that was automatically reverted within, within one minute. Um, and yeah, thanks you very much for listening to me. Uh, we have a some time for like a few questions if you have any. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, like um, we will do like a complementary blog post with all the actual technical detail of how we uh, enabled um, the different aspects of this migration and, and our setup. And if you have any question in general uh, about the gritty details, please um, you know grab me after this, uh, grab me during the conference. Any any questions? Yes. Um, I yeah I, I kind of. Um, I got the essence of what you're asking about. So about the, the migration process, when we scale up and down the different... Uh, the exactly. Yeah, so when you're scaling up and down the deployment versus rollout, I think sometimes what I've heard is that there can be some kind of cost repercussions because either you have two workloads, you know, that are both scaled up fully or you have to have downtime to scale one down to roll out the, the rollout. Um, did you guys... Was that ever a conversation in terms of that process, especially with the scale that you guys were rolling out these microservices at? Um, so, so, sorry, so the question is like, was it was it a problem for us in general? Yeah, or I guess was it was it a, a topic of conversation, like a concern about maybe like lack of resources in, in duplicating these workloads or, or something? Um, like that? So we kind of like didn't add that much of the problem because um, due to the nature of what we are, like a bank, we basically run with a lot of overhead in our cluster. So we had like a load of like uh, capacity um, capacity left over. Like the whole point of doing this migration, uh, you know, of like spreading, spreading out the migration across like the entire day is to make sure like, you know, to control for those kind of problem where yeah, sure, you're gonna run double the workload for like a short amount of time for a couple of minutes. And if you spread them out, you know, across across the day, uh, for example, for our lowest tier services, we did batch of 200, like spread out over like eight hours, which basically means you have like one migration every five, 10 minutes. Um, and the migration process itself only lasts for like two, three minutes. So that's all we control for it. And that's why we you know, decided to go slow to be, to be extra safe. But yeah, in, indeed, that's something to take care of because you don't, uh, and that's also the whole point about doing this migrator, uh, having this migrator pattern and checking that we add the right number of 
support that we're expecting um, because for very, very large deployment um, with like 500 pods, sometimes it would take like a couple of retries to, you know, it would take time for pods to actually um, come up due to scheduling pressure. So yeah, that's why we, yeah, okay. we went yeah, that Thank way. you. Uh, 17 seconds, any question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool, perfect. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, thank you very much. And, um, <laughs>